everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. This is a really good turnout. You should know that there's a private competition going between all the LTI seminar speakers who gets the biggest audience, OK? So uh, I think you may be winning, Wayne. Well done. Uh, so for those who don't know me, I'm Martin Weller. Uh, I'm convening this series. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. It's being recorded. So uh, well, if you don't want to appear on the recording, uh, when you ask a question, just say so, and they can edit it out. We'll upload it to the IIT's YouTube channel afterwards, and I usually blog it. Um, and I think on the email that we send around about the next talk, that we embed the link as well. Uh, the next seminar will be on the 23rd of January about learning design. So put that in your diaries now. OK, so that's the housekeeping bit. Uh, so uh, the talk today is about uh, artificial intelligence. Um, I think of all the topics we cover in this series, perhaps it's AI is the one that generates the most, most heat, let's put it like that. Um, I did a PhD in artificial intelligence in 1994, and it was already then in its kind of second wave of enthusiasm. Um, and we, a lot of the ideas that were around then, we keep coming back to them, this idea of intelligent tutors, uh, automatic assessment, those kind of things. Um, and I think with big data and more powerful machines there, maybe some of that promise is now realizable. I think the question we're facing now is, do we want it to be? Um, so I'm delighted that my uh, colleague, uh, Wayne Holmes here, will help us sort hype from reality here. Um, Wayne works in a number of AI and education projects. He's on the all-party all -party parliamentary group in AI. Um, his, uh, his presentation is going to be interactive, so get phones out. We'll be doing that stuff. Uh, so here to tell us if we're going to be replaced by robots is Dr. Wayne Holmes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so as it says here, um, my presentation is about AI and the Open University, um, looking at the opportunity, uh, the reality, and the risks. Um, however, I could and perhaps should have called it this, in the sense that um, it's here, right? This is nothing that we don't already use. This isn't something that's in the future. AI is already here, whether we like it or not, and so it's about us to try and engage, and thank you for coming along today, to try and engage to make sure that actually the way in which it is used um, actually has some credibility. So um, Martin mentioned um, mobile phones and laptops. I've got a first question that I would like to put straight out to you. If you can access this, then please do so now. So I'll just give you um, a few seconds to do this. So it's pretty straightforward to get there. And then on the next screen, I'm going to ask you a question. And what I would like you to do is to respond to that question as quickly as you can. OK? I'll just give you... So if you could just indicate when you're, when you're in so I get a feel. OK, we're getting a few people in. Thank you. Okay, great. So, um, let's move on. So, are you ready for the question? If you haven't got you know, that, uh, anything to go to this site, that's not a problem. Just have a think about the answer. Okay, so here is the question. Okay, so let's move on, just on the off chance it has worked, and let's see what we're getting. Um, well, thank you for that. This is a question I've asked in America, in Germany, in China, and pretty much this is the answer I get. So in other words, many, many people thought of robots. It happens all the time. And even Martin started this by talking about robots. And so when we talk about AI, robots is a thing that's often brought to, the, to, to mind. And whenever I submit a piece of writing to a journal or whatever, and they're going to illustrate it with something, the first thing they do is they put a, a robot um, as the picture. But who, who said this? Hands up if you said autonomous cars. Okay, well, this is one of the biggest areas in which AI is being used at the moment. How about this? Any thoughts on this? No? Nobody talked about playing games. What about playing computer games? Anybody play computer games? Okay. So AI is all through this. 
Who uses Siri or Alexa in the home? None of you? Some of you. Okay, so the point is, AI is pretty much everywhere. So the stock markets, weather forecasting. Do you take photographs? Have you noticed how the square hits the faces? Well, that's AI. Have you been through passport control recently? Okay, well, that's AI. What about this? Anybody ideas what this might represent? It's a bit squidgy, I know, I apologize for that. This is predictive policing. So this is using AI in this particular city to identify where the police believe that crime is gonna take place. So the areas of the red is where they send the police in order to make sure they, they get the, uh, the perpetrators before it happens. Um, how about this? Yeah, I'm sorry, AI is in sports as well. I know nothing about sports, but it's used it all the time to predict how we can improve our team play to make sure that the teams are doing well. Um, what's that? What about, have you um, been ever phoned up by your credit card company saying, we noticed a suspicious transaction on your account? Well, that's not somebody looking, that's, that's AI. How about this? This is uh, a very bad photograph in this light, but anyway, it's a photograph of the retina, the back of the eye. So there's an AI project, Google DeepMind, where they're identifying people with particular problems to predict whether or not they will get diabetes. All AI. This is a tool that you can log on now. I was in London yesterday and there's posters everywhere. Babylon. And you can type in, you can give it your symptoms and it will give you your, um, your diagnosis. If you've attempted to get a loan recently, um, that's all an AI decision. What about this? What does this represent, do you think? I can't hear you. <laughs> fake news, thank you. It's fake news. So the point is, there are banks of AI out there that are writing fake news. Fortunately, there are also some people out there who are writing um, uh, computer uh, systems, AI systems, to try and detect fake news, and we'll come back to that later. What about this? Anybody use Google Translate? Okay, so the point is with all this is that AI is here. We're not talking about some future technology anymore. There has been a dramatic change in the past decade, and that's due to the arrival of lots of big data, um, better computational approaches, um, and these things together have led to this mushrooming, and so we're now going to a situation where just AI is, is all over the place. So it affects our lives in lots of different ways. The thing is, as we've noticed, we don't really think of it in those terms. We don't think of it as AI. We think of it as all these different things. But one of the areas that I'm particularly interested, for obvious reasons, is this. Is AI being used in education? Now, the reason I picked this photograph is because this, I took it and this was in China and it was an amazing experience. Um, but just because I'm working here with students, with school students, does not mean to say this is not relevant across the educational uh, spectrum. So, just like AI is here, something that's really important that we're aware of is AI is here in education now. It's already here, it's already doing stuff. Um, and it's working in different ways. So depending on what the project is, it's being used to help us understand learning, but it's also helping us in some ways to enhance learning. And these are the two strands that are happening all the time. And one of the ways it does this is by being student-facing. So it develops tools. We have tools where the students engage with the tool and the AI determines what the students do through the course of their practice. But also we can have teacher-facing tools and personally, I'm more interested in these because these are ways in which we can support teachers in our context ALs to support our learners. So this, for me, is um, a really uh, interesting and important area that more and more people are getting um, involved in. Okay, so that was my introduction, and this is what I intend talking about today. Um, so we'll start with a quick introduction to AI, because I think although AI is around us all the way, there's a lot of mythologies around it, and people don't really know what it is. And you know, I've been, I'm, I'm a learning scientist, not a computer scientist, and it, I've been engaged in this field now for um, five or six years, and it's kind of tough 
to actually work out what the hell does this stuff actually mean when they say they got AI, what does it do? How does it do these things? So we'll have a look at that briefly. To start with, we're academics, a lot of us, and that is one of the things here, is that you know, what actually is AI is, um, can be difficult to define. So um, one of the reasons is it, it constantly shifts, and as we've seen just now, there are a lot of things that are happening, so when we think we've got a handle on what it is, suddenly something else appears, and it's, it's something quite different. Um, but equally, it's interdisciplinary, and I think for me that's one of the reasons I got involved in the field at all, is because it's fantastic to be working with people from all different disciplines to work out how we can move these things forward and what's actually possible. But although it's difficult to define, naturally, um, my colleagues and I, we've had a go at defining it. So this is what we've come up with. So computer systems that have been designed to interact with the world through capabilities such as visual perception and speech recognition and intelligent behaviours um, such as um, assessing information, taking sensible actions. But anyway, things that we would normally think of as being human. So it's not that it's doing what humans do, it's that it looks like it's doing what humans do. It's not doing it as humans do, but to our appearance and to how things actually work, it kind of feels like that. But as you can imagine, um, AI is also pretty complicated. There's lots of different areas in which it gets involved. Um, there's lots of technologies that it uses. There are lots of um, approaches to AI. And, you know, we're getting quite philosophical there. But there are also lots of, now, more recently, AI as a service. So in other words, whereas five years ago, if you wanted to do something in AI, you'd have to build the, the coding from the ground up. Now, you can use these services, and you can grab bits of these services and pull them together. I say you can, I can't, but my colleagues can. But it makes it a much simpler, much faster process, so we can start embedding AI approaches in lots of different contexts. And there's lots of different applications, lots of different areas. All the pictures that I showed earlier, there's lots of different things, lots of ways in which AI is in, impacting on, on what we're doing. So one of the key things um, in the way that AI works, and um, one of the things that, one of the words that you hear most often are algorithms. Algorithms. And it's actually, if you look at it, the way that we can understand AI, the history of AI, is about the history of the development of algorithms. That's how it's kind of worked. And I always like this as an example, um, because there we have an algorithm. It's a pretty simple algorithm, but it's that simple algorithm that led to the, the huge organization called Google. Um, it was all based on that in the first place. And algorithms are really, they're, they're just steps, they're computer programs. And you can have, um, or they're representing a computer program, and you can have very short algorithms, very long algorithms, but that's really all it is. It's a set of steps that we work through. But, as we said earlier, what makes them distinct is that these algorithms are actually looking at things that are thought to be um, human in their um, work. As I say, it's not that it's doing the things, but it appears that it's doing the things. So I thought I would just give you some more of the big words that you often hear um, if you read a newspaper, because let's face it, you can't open a newspaper these days or switch on the TV without some reference to AI. So here's one of them, machine learning. And machine learning is a very particular approach to AI that depends on lots of data. And, but a lot of people conflate the two, AI and machine learning, as they're the same thing, and they're not the same thing. In, to be really specific about it, machine learning is a subset of AI. There's lots of other approaches to AI, such as uh, rule-based systems, etc., cetera, um, that have been around for a long time. But the explosion that we've seen over the past few years um, is mainly due to machine learning approaches. And one machine learning approach is called supervised learning. So if any of you use Facebook and you ever um, tag the people in your photographs, well, you may notice that now Facebook will sometimes tag the people for you. And the way that it did that is by it took all of the photographs that people had already tagged, had already labelled, and it used that to work out how it could identify people in the photographs and how it could then tag them. 
So that approach is called supervised learning, and it's, it's pretty big. There's also, of course, the opposite, unsupervised learning. And unsupervised learning is when you take a whole bunch of data and the system tries to find within that data um, patterns, patterns that exist across. And so the reason for the picture of the cat is that this was one of the first big um, projects that uh, the Facebook and Google people would do, is they would say, right, here we have millions of images, and we now want you to cluster. We want you to find the patterns in these images. And through doing that process, that's how those systems can now say, right, that is a photograph of a cat. We also have reinforcement learning, which is a bit like um, uh, natural selection. And we also have evolutionary AI. So it goes on and on. I'm not going to spend any time on those, but they'll be in the PowerPoint if you want to have a look at it. Um, but neural networks is one of the other areas that has become increasingly important. And a neural network has got that name because it bases its approach on the way our neurons and our brains work. But it's at a completely different scale, whereas our brain has um, millions of neurons, each with thousands of connections. Um, in uh, computer-based ones, they're far fewer. Um, having said that, there are some systems that have hundreds of um, layers of neurons in there. Um, the way it works is that What's different about these is that instead of you saying, developing a program to tell the, the system what to do, you develop a program so the system learns itself what to do. And that's the advantage of the neural network. So it's this kind of approach that was used in the, um, the Google DeepMind that beats um, the world's leading uh, player of Go. And that's all done through the um, neural network approach. And it's, those, it's the hidden layers, it's the bits between the, the input and the output that actually give it the power. And the more of those that we have, um, it, then that turns into what we call deep learning, or what they call deep learning. The bottom bullet there is, is really quite important. And this is an area that is exercising a lot of really bright people in the world of AI at the moment, is that with um, this kind of approach to AI, it can be incredibly difficult to understand how the AI came up with its decision. Because the layers in between the input and the output, there can be so many, we can't work out the patterns and the pathways it took. As I say, there are lots of people that are trying to uh, tackle this problem at the moment. But if you think just for a moment about implementing this in a, an educational context, the kind of problems it raises. The system can make a decision but if we don't know how the system came to its decision, how can we uh, promote it? Okay, two final things on this whirlwind tour of the world, of the crazy world of AI, is to talk about narrow AI and general AI. So narrow AI is all the kind of stuff we've been talking about. So if we have um, um, a piece of AI that's been developed to um, win at the game of Go, it cannot play chess. We've got a piece of AI that has been designed to identify pictures of cats. It can't um, identify text, and so on and so forth. But that is the vast majority, if not virtually all, AI today is narrow AI. But when you read about the people who are really concerned about how AI is going to take over the world and the rise of the robots and all that kind of stuff, well, that's when we talk about general AI. And general AI is the notion that we have an AI system that can actually do what humans can do. But the point is that this is a long, long way in the future still. You know, there are people been researching this since the origins of AI um, 60 years ago, and they're still researching it now, and they've got plans for the future. And maybe something will happen, who knows? But the point is, it ain't here now, and it's not going to be for quite a long time. Okay, so... Um, that was AI in terms of the technologies and the approaches and the possibilities. What I'm now going to look at is AI in education. I'm going to introduce you to um, a bunch of different approaches. Um, and while I do that, um, I'd like you, if you have access to a laptop or a phone or whatever, to go to Padlet. So it's a pretty straightforward link there. Um, and I'd like you to have a think about this. And so while I'm showing you stuff, if you just want to add your thoughts into the Padlet, um, and it, anything related to this, frankly, would be really interesting at this point. And at the end of this section, we'll go back to this and have a look at what people have written. 
And, um, and yeah, so what we think. So has everybody got that, that web link? Can I move on? Sorry, on reflection, I should have turned into a shorter link. I apologize. Okay, are we there? Yeah, can I have some indication? Some of you there? You're there? Yeah, okay, cool. So I'm going to move on. Okay, so there are multiple ways, as you can imagine, that AI has been used in educational context. And I'm going to talk about these five. These are the five biggest, and I think they're the ones that we need to think about mostly. And some of these, the most of these, are student facing. Some of them also have uh, teacher-facing elements to them. But anyway, we're going to look at, firstly, what are called intelligent tutoring systems. Now, clearly they're called intelligent because they come from artificial intelligence, but whether they're intelligent or not is, is a huge issue. Having said that, there are many out there. Huge now, Every time I look, I, I keep stumbling across, oh, there's another system, there's another system. So what's interesting about them is that they provide step-by-step -step tutorials. So the student sits in front of a computer and the system will present some information, present a task, and the student will engage with that task. So far, so normal. But then after that, depending on what the student did in that task, will determine the next task or the next piece of information. So that each individual student will take their own pathway um, through this. Um, Yeah, so the idea is that for each individual student, if a student's been very successful, they might raise the level of challenge. If a student is, is struggling, the level of challenge might be lowered. They might discover that actually with these connections, we need to go in a slightly different direction. So it's trying to make this, the, the learning for each individual student personalised. Right? We're all interested in personalised learning. This is the AI systems that, that attempts to do that. So, um, very, very briefly, this is how these systems do it. Um, they work on the basis, have various models. So, we have a model of the learner. So, this is a model of the individual, which we build up over time, depending on what the student does, their achievements, their challenges, misconceptions they show, and we keep that in a place that we can then look back at later. But it's not just the individual student, it's also all the students who've in, in, interacted with this system. And when you start rolling this out across many, many students, the number of data points increases hugely. So that's one of the models. The second model is the domain model. So this is a model of the subject area, so be it physics, be it mathematics, be it um, history, whatever it is, but represented in a computer model. And then we have the pedagogy model. And this is a representation of the way in which we think teaching works most effectively. So using these three models, we have a student in front of the system, and the student is um, provided with a particular adaptive learning experience, and they engage with that experience. And while they engage, the system is capturing their data. So it captures what they click, what they type. Some systems capture what they say. Some systems capture the emotional expression on their face. That data is analysed. And then from that, we might immediately get some feedback. So this is a way of giving automatic feedback to the individual, depending on what they're doing and what the system has determined is appropriate for that individual. But equally, it will determine what the next adaptive um, learning experience the student will be presented with. So in other words, or immediately we're now going down a different pathway depending on the experience of those individual students. In addition, um, the, um, the learner model is updated so that the student, so the information about the student, about what they've just done and about their experience goes back into the model so we now have a slightly better model. But also that adds to the whole model of all the students. So we have a slightly better model and understanding of all the students. And equally, in fact, the, 
that analysis can also contribute to both the domain model and the pedagogy model. If we discover ways in which um, the pedagogy is more effective, then we might shift other students in that direction. We up that, that approach compared to other approaches. And sometimes um, the domain model can change, not because we're um, changing the information, but because of the way in which we might structure that information, the way that information is, is presented. So that's one method for doing an ITS, and there are many, but that's a, a, a simplified version of it. But here's to introduce one of them. So this product called Mathia, um, originally um, it was called Cognitive Tutor, um, and it's been around for at least a decade now. It emerged out of Carnegie Mellon University. And this has now been used by thousands of students across the states. Um, as it says there, um, it has been um, researched in, um, by these independent people and there is good stories to tell about it. Um, not necessarily perfect outcomes, but nevertheless good stories. But one thing that's particularly interesting about them is that they now um, don't just allow you to buy the software. They have recognized that there needs to be a human element in this. So you can now buy the whole system which has lots of resources for the teacher, despite the fact this is a system for students. So, as I was saying, it captures all those student interactions, um, it uses that data to learn, and it does clever things like rephrasing questions and redirecting the student and focusing on parts of the, the curriculum that that student um, is finding a bit challenging. So as I say, there are loads of those, and I picked this one just because it's, it's probably the most successful so far. Okay, moving on to my second type of AI in education, and that's dialogue-based tutoring systems. So dialogue-based tutoring systems, um, instead of having this sequence of here's a task, do it, here's some feedback, instead they engage the student um, in a conversation. So originally with these systems it would be a typed conversation, but increasingly these are spoken conversations. So... Um, it uses this logic that actually, if you can get someone to, um, to explain something, to articulate it, then that A, helps understanding, but also B, helps um, you as the teacher know where this person is in their learning process. And it uses the Socratic principles. So it's about probing, making a suggestion, pulling back, and having a dialogue between the two systems, the person, the student, and the, and the computer system. So this is, a, this is an approach that's been um, researched for a long time. And the way it works is, say, the tutor will give a question, the student will attempt to answer, the tutor will provide feedback specific to what the student has written. Then the system and the student engage in this spiral uh, conversation, and then with the tutor constantly trying to check, does, is there understanding here? Um, so here's an example of a kind of a conversation that might take place. So the system is saying, um, let's review this, try answering this question. What are some variations in the definition of family? And the student might type, a family can be defined as people who live together. The system thinks this is not particularly useful, so it pushes it a bit further. Um, that's a good start, but actually let's build upon that. And so the conversation continues. Now, I mentioned this has been going for 30 years, and the original versions of this, the way they would work is they would take 30 textbooks and digitize the information in those textbooks and use that as the corpus that the student is working through. Um, you'll see the Pearson logo, and Pearson, one of the biggest publishers. So this system now works. Pearson create a textbook. They hand the textbook over to IBM, and vump, this system is now working. And it's engaging the students working towards an understanding of the content in this textbook. And that's all it requires. OK, moving on to another example then, exploratory learning environments. So whereas with the first two, we've had a system that's actually um, taken the students step by step, either by giving them a task or by going through a conversation with this one, and um, what we do instead is the, 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 the student is given an opportunity to explore. So this is a much more constructivist approach to learning, whereas the others are much more didactic, instructionist approaches. Um, and what is particularly important here 
And the, the, the main role of the AI at this point is that the AI is given the guidance and the feedback. And that's really important because we know from all the research that whilst we can, um, a, a constructivist exploratory environment is, can be really powerful for learning, actually it doesn't work on its own terms. It really needs that feedback and guidance to, to nudge the student in the right direction. On their own, they probably won't learn a great deal, but with the guidance that these systems can provide, that can happen much more effectively. So this was um, a project I was involved in called Fractions Lab, and the idea is it's um, the students are given a tool, uh, sorry, given the interface and they're given the task, but how they get from A to Z in this task, it can change from student to student. But while they're engaging with the tools on the screen, the system is monitoring them all the time, seeing what they're doing, inferring misconceptions and giving responses. So this is just a bit of the architecture. Um, and on the left there, you see the TDS and the, at the bottom TIS. And that's just saying that we're giving a task dependent support, so support specific to that particular task, but also um, uh, uh, feedback that's independent of the individual task. And here's some examples. So you can see there that um, if the student makes one particular representation, then the, the system might give you that. Um, ha, ha, have you changed the numerator or the denominator? So it's not telling them the right answer, but it's giving them a push, a bit of guidance. On the other hand, um, just the independent support, quite tricky. What is the task asking you to do? So it can say that kind of with any task. It's not really um, specific. But all of these kind of things give that student a little bit of a boost, a little bit of help, a little bit of guidance so they don't wander um, around all over the shop. Okay, our fourth example, um, automatic writing evaluation. And before we started, I was speaking to Martin, he was pointing out, you know, this kind of stuff was around a long time ago. And this is true, this has been around an awful long time. Um, but what this is using um, is um, natural language processing, semantic processing to analyze um, written pieces of work so that the system can respond to it in some way. Now, there are two ways. It can be formative. So in other words, it's given advice and suggestions how the student might improve this system. But equally, it can be summative. Here is a mark. Um, and the reality is that much of the work is at the marking end. Why? Because it's seen as a way in which you can automate things, therefore save money, and lots of um, interesting things like that. But the reality is actually the formative approach can be far more powerful. So giving the student that information, that guidance, so they can go back and improve their assignment and then resubmit it until the guidance is saying, hey, that's, that's, you're, you're doing okay there. And then they can choose to submit it for the final assessment. So we have a system here that was developed um, in the OU with Oxford. Um, Professor Denise Whitelock led on this for the OU. And this system is exactly this about formative feedback. So this does not give marks at all. So although when you first hear about automatic uh, writing evaluation, lots of people, hang on, this is terrible. Well, actually, not necessarily, because here it's working really quite interestingly. And it's using some of the words we've talked about, the unsupervised learning and the natural language processing. And given the representations, you can almost see on the right-hand side of the screen there that help the student to understand the balance, the structure, the kind of text they're in. Uh, they're in. So it's to give them information to support, not just telling them what to do. Okay, my final example then. What um, Stamatina has sat there and I decided to call learning network orchestrators because it sounded big and important. Um, the point is, what's interesting about this is that for the most part, all of these systems, it's about the system being clever and, and somehow guiding or giving information to the student. It's the system that's in control. But what I really like about this is it's not the system in control, it's about the system giving support to students so students can make the decisions. So this is a tool, again, that I came across in China um, where um, it's essentially it's a dating app. So the AI is pretty simple in this. What happens is at the end of a class, a student can call out, pull out their mobile phone, go on the app and say, go to the... Um, I, I didn't understand the differential calculus, or I was confused by this. And they can look for tutors um, that are available to give them one-to-one -one tuition. And then the one-to-one -one tuition happens 
and through the mobile phone, they can share screens, they can share text, they can't see each other. That was always thought to be really quite critical. Um, but it's, it's putting the student in control. So instead of the system saying, you need to learn about differential calculus, it's the student saying, I don't understand this, I want to find out, and here is the tool to help you do it. Now, it does necessarily um, include um, human tutors, and the consequence of that is it is quite expensive. But in many ways, you know, we have a lot of tutors at the OU, so maybe possibilities, I don't know. Okay, so at this point I'm going to try and switch across to the Padlet, if I can, and see what people say. Oh, it's very big, isn't it? So anybody want to own up to any of this? <laughs> I think I can infer um, a computer scientist has done one of them. Any thoughts? So what, what are your thoughts from what I've shown? Can you think of any ways in which any of that stuff has any um, application to the Open University? In a room full of people who are so quiet. I can't believe it. Some of this has been around for a very long time, and you, some of us have been involved in doing it for a very long time. And as you say, machine, machine learning these days opens up possibilities that weren't previously there. And we should have a look at them now. So I can infer that you think we should be looking at this, and there are possibilities, in your opinion, that it might be useful to support our students. Yes, um, cautiously though, because we've, we've done a lot of this in the past and a fraction of it has proved useful um, and some of it has not really proved useful. And I imagine that's what we'll find again. We'll do some stuff, some of it will work and be, we'll adopt it and we'll no longer think of it as AI and other stuff won't work, but we had to try it. Anybody else? probably roughly similar that I think it's with some of it has got to be a bit of uh, suck it and see that we can see things like simple chatbots to answer simple questions could work really well I can see that the intelligent learning systems if you're looking at diagnostics what can you do to prepare for your next step and that sort of thing could be good that's rather different to automated marking and I will confess to the being the one who said when I've seen that it's the automated marking of essays, but I've seen it has been poor and students will feel what, they're pay what are they paying for with it. I think we can definitely look at exploring these to enhance the experience, but not as a replacement for any of the human contacts we have now. Okay, I'm conscious of the time, so I think... Thank like, you sorry, I'd just oh, like sorry, to respond on. to that and ask, has anyone at any point suggested it should replace human contact? I think the answer to that is some people have, but that doesn't mean to say they're in the majority. Yeah. No. Okay, moving on. Moving on. So I want to talk a bit about the opportunity. Um, so if you want to Padlet, it's exactly the same address, but AIED 2 at the end. Okay, so exactly the same address as you had before, but AIED 2. Um, so what I'm going to talk about are the different things that could happen. Now, one of the things that we know at the OU is that getting our students to collaborate with each other is even harder than it is in face-to-face -face institutions. Collaboration, we know, can be very powerful, but equally, we know, it can be really difficult both to organise and to participate in. Well, there are ways in which, potentially, the AI might support that. Um, another way in which um, AI might support is with um, learning companions. So the idea is that you know, we all carry our, um, our mobile phone in our pocket. Well, we can have AI on there that's supporting the student. So it's giving information about what piece of work is due soon, where they can look for new information, giving guidance. Here's a video you might be interested in, making connection with other students. So this becomes an intelligent tool in our pocket, potentially. Um, Another opportunity 
our assistance for our ALs. So tools that actually provide all of the information that the students, that the ALs might find useful about their students, about what their students are doing elsewhere, about um, giving that connection. And one of the things um, at the bottom there um, could make exams a thing of the past. So maybe we don't need exams. Maybe we can be monitoring uh, students uh, through what they do, the kind of engagement they do. So there's a host of different possibilities here. Um, another thing that we're currently looking at is the use of AI in the forums. So we know we have lots of forums across the university. Any one course might have several forums. We have large groups of students. But the problem is that sometimes it's, very, um, it's possible that a particular post might be missed. But some easy posts could be responded to by the AI. So the AI could say, well, in response to, you know, when is my um, exam taking place? Um, the AI could interject and say, well, this is when it's happening. Whereas more complex issues, the AI wouldn't get engaged in. Um, but equally, other things we could do is to aggregate the posts so that we identify what are the themes among the thousand posts so that our ALs can respond to the themes more usefully. Um, we could also use perhaps sentiment analysis to try and identify when the students are um, perhaps not uh, responding particularly strongly to what they're doing when they're worried, perhaps even, you know, edging on mental health issues. There are, these are the kind of things that the AI could support. Um, we could also, and this is another area we're looking at, is the learning design. And lots of people are involved in learning design. Well, we may be able to develop tools to support the development of our modules, the mapping of our modules to the learning design, and also use this information so that our analytics are more um, robust, so that we can learn what kinds of learning designs in what context actually allows us to move forward and do things, thing, um, things that are useful. Now, I'm conscious that time is um, against me, so I'm going to move on and not uh, to look at um, the Padlet, but it's there and I will look at it later. Um, so I just want to look at what kind of things are happening at the OU at the present time. Um, so there are things like uh, the student support to which our um, AI working group from IT have been working on, and this is providing um, a gathering data from across the university so that module teams and effectively ALs can actually use this information um, and also a, a student support team can use this information to give um, additional support to um, students who clearly need some extra support. Um, we do have a chatbot that has been developed, uh, again, for student support. Um, at the moment, it's only, been, it's only a proof of concept working in um, for examinations, um, but nevertheless, this is already happening. Um, our colleagues in computer science, their PhD students are involved in a range of AI projects that are beginning to have an impact and have possibilities, could um, support work that's going on inside the university, um, the teaching and learning. Um, also, the same group was, um, are working on uh, with the Institute of Coding, which is a pan across many institutions and looking at various things, but um, we're having um, actual modules being developed as we speak to deal with this. We also have um, our... Um, a languages school who are using um, Alexa to um, help their students understand how language happens. So it's coming out using AI in a completely different direction. But you know, from that whirlwind tour, hopefully you'll realize, you'll see that actually there's a huge amount of things there that are beginning to happen that have some possibilities. But finally, move on to the risks. And I do apologize for my timing. I didn't realize how slow I was. But anyway, so on the risks. Um, we know that um, AI is being used out there in various ways. And one of the ways in the States it's been used in the criminal justice system. But the reality is that these systems are incredibly poor. As it says here, the systems are identifying disproportionately people from um, the African-American community and saying, well, they are the criminals, you know, when there's no evidence that actually in reality this is true. It's not just there, though. 
and the Metropolitan Police use face recognition at Notting Hill Carnival to identify um, the uh, perpetrators of crime. Um, but they got a 98% um, false positive. Now, I suspect that next year it'll only be 80% false positive and the following year it will it'll improve and improve. But the point is, it is not good at the moment and we need to engage with these kind of decisions. Bringing it back to education, this for me is one of the most fearful areas um, because uh, Facebook are doing an awful lot of work using their version of AI and their approach to social engagement um, in schools. And it's only a matter of time this is going to grow and grow in various different ways. And as um, a great uh, person once said, um, with great power comes great responsibility. And this is the reality. These tools are powerful. And if we don't roll them out in, in sensible ways, it means that actually we could have real uh, problems here. And so we really do need to engage quite carefully. So the ways in which um, the kind of the areas, the ethical areas that we need to be considering are firstly in AI, one of the areas we talk about all the time and people talk about all the time um, is the data. So we have to think about the data. What are the ethical issues of the data? How do we make sure that the data is, we're, we're strong about that and we don't do it unethically? But it's not just that, it's also the algorithms. It's the way in which this data is processed and computed. And there are a whole range of different issues um, that we really should be thinking about there as well. But that's taken two of the areas, but this is AI in an educational context. So what about the education bit? Now, education comes with its own ethical consequences, its own ethical issues that we have to raise and think about all the time. And so when we put all these together, we get lots of overlaps. So you get the ethics of algorithms with big data, you get learning analytics, and a lot of work has come out of the OU on this. There's a little bit of work coming out about the algorithms and education, the impact of those on each other. But no one's really looking at what happens when all three of these kind of collide in the middle. This is a huge area that we really need to be engaging with. So at the OU, um, we do have, um, for the AI working group, a set of um, ethical principles that we're working to and attempt to make sure that we're not doing anything that is bad. And so things like transparency on the one hand, able to pull out on the other hand, things like being um, open, um, are all, we're trying to build that in from the ground up. But we talked about the marking earlier, and the marking has huge range of ethical issues that people are not engaging with. They're kind of forgetting that these principles. But equally, um, th this is one of the things that, that makes me worry is that the, the angle that we come at here is we say, look, um, uh, teachers have these huge burdens. But what we can do, we can introduce the AI if we can take some of these burdens off the shoulders of the teachers. So now the teachers can focus on the cognitive parts of teaching, right? But then we can introduce some more AI. So then we can, the teachers can refocus again and they can focus on the human aspects, the interactions and so on and so forth. Well then perhaps we can enhance the AI. And then the teachers now become like KFC chefs working to a script. And one of the IT companies I listed earlier, this is part of their marketing, that this is what they're aiming to do. So then we enhance the AI and then we're not sure. So, I'm not arguing that this is inevitable. What I'm arguing is if we don't engage, there are these problems that really need to come into place here. Um, emotion detection is another area. This is a lovely video, and what they're doing is in this school, uh, the students are being watched continually by this AI. And the it's not just about who do they interact with and are they not killing somebody, it is are they concentrating? Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they confused? And this is happening continuously. And you can see there from the kind of um, comments in there about what people are really worried about. So this is China, but we have schools in the US who are using this tech, and we have schools in the UK that are beginning to contemplate it as well. Now, for me, this is the problem. So those of you who are familiar with this, um, that's trying to... Um, 
get access to this, uh, this child. So for me, technology is, is we have in the middle there. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to use the technology to support on the one hand. But on the other hand, we have issues like privacy. And how do we balance that? How do we do it without destroying what we're trying to actually uh, deal with here? And I think this, for me, is one of the really key um, areas um, that we should consider. Okay, I have another video there, but we'll move on because of the time. Um, so, with the, um, the risks, with the um, trying to make sure that we're doing this in an ethical stance, it's both negative and positive. So, one aspect of this is stopping people doing bad. You know, the Google line, do no evil. Okay, so we, we, we put out ethical principles so we don't do nasty things. But if you see it around the other way, if we get the ethical principles right in the first place, that actually gives the opportunity for us to develop really quite interesting and, and useful things. So, final thoughts, given the time. Um, whether we like it or not, um, AI is having a major impact, and it's going to have an impact here. Whether we like it or not, it's going to happen, and it's up to us to engage. So we have to engage, we have to talk, we have to make sure that we are part of that conversation. Um, but equally, I don't think we should just think, well, how can we use AI to do what we do now a bit better? That's a bit boring. We can actually use the AI in some of the ways I've shown that actually stretch what we do and perhaps challenge what we do in different ways. Um, not saying any one particular one is right or wrong, but there are, I think, there are um, huge possibilities. Um, so, for me, we have to start um, with the learning and not be seduced by, those, by the tech. Okay, thank you very much. I apologise there wasn't as much interactivity as I'd hoped, but um, I will be looking at your Padlets later. Thank you. Thanks for a very balanced talk. Um, it seems to me there's lots of things you're trying to balance. There's kind of the effectiveness of technology, ethics and greater benefit for learners. I think keeping all those things going is, is not too complex. So uh, we'll open it up for questions. Ah, could you go back a couple of slides to that one where you have, you know, we improve the AI, we improve the AI, we improve the AI? Uh, that's the one. Right, okay. So um, I run a level three module. I wrote, I write um, assessment for it, and obviously I write tutor notes. I have tried to get teachers to focus on the human aspects of teaching. I have had complaints from the ALs that my mark schemes were not prescriptive enough. Therefore, they want to become more like KFC chefs. So is this line here, where you get down to the teachers still needed, are you suggesting this is a bad thing? Because it seems to me that this is what the ALs want. I haven't... I <laughs> You, you're, you're <laughs> your, your experience, Alistair, as ever, is unique. Um, I'm not arguing... Um, the point I'm trying to make here is that this is the kind of future that is possible and could be likely, and we need to think about whether we think this is good, and if we don't think it's good, then we need to engage in different ways to see how we can take it in the direction we want. Uh, I think we could have long discussions about the benefits and negatives of some of this, but I do think, nevertheless, that is what we should be doing. As a community, as a university, we should be thinking about these issues now as these kind of things become more, um, more dominant across the university. want to know about the way the OU uses their personal data and, the, and, and how the OU uses data generally. And we have a rising wave of, of students wanting to know about marking guidelines and about the thinking behind it. And I think whatever way we go on this, I think it's going to be very important to be transparent with students and tell them what we're doing. But I think that might be challenging to do that, don't you think? Yeah, you said it sometimes it's hard to know the thinking behind the AI. To <coughs> say if a student 
say, if you, an it, automatic decision is made. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, I think that is very challenging, and we do need to be very careful about that. But I think it's even more complicated than that. So we've got the tool that our colleagues have built, OU Analyze, for example, that can identify, can predict um, which students are going to um, be successful or not. And, but there's lots of evidence from the literature that we know about where if we show um, information about um, what you're achieving on an ongoing basis and what you're likely to see do, if we show that information to students uh, you know, above average um, in achievement, then that empowers them and they go even faster and more successfully. But the students who are at the bottom end of that spectrum, they find that soul destroying and they're more likely on seeing the information to drop out. The, the reality is we have a moral obligation to make that information available to them. The question is, how do we do it in a way that doesn't undermine them? That's a human aspect of teaching coming in there. So if, if you're going to give someone some information that's going to affect their study, you need to then follow that up with support, particularly if it's presented <coughs> in a negative way, like you say there. So allow them to take the, you're going to fail, and change it to, you're not going to fail, you're going to pass and, and push forward with the support of the uh, university behind. Yeah, no, I agree. And th that's exactly the kind of discussions that we need to have to think about what is the balance that's appropriate for the OU. Uh, just before we wrap up, I wouldn't mind a, 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 an Uther input from this. Um, is there a particular area where you think this could be a real benefit to students kind of in some areas that they struggle with? If, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot. Not really. Um, I think sometimes it could be a non-threatening thing for some students, the ones who need extra support and things, although I would like them to go out and be prepared to ask their tutors, the fact is a lot of them feel a little bit awkward about it, so the sort of diagnostics you're struggling with this to guide you towards that could be good. I think the sort of low-level chatbot thing to of which you could get immediate answers to questions rather than having to call up student support team would be quite quite good as well. So there's some obvious ones that just came to mind. <laughs> no, I think that's a good point. I think you know, I've got to learning is quite a vulnerable process. It's kind of a way to expose that without some sorry. I, I no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I agree. Uh, and and there's an interesting app that's been released. You know, somebody and one of the Padlet we did manage to get through talked about the Eliza bot. And actually it's um, this new app is about um, if you, if you suffer from anxiety. Okay, you can have a conversation with the bot. Now the point is, a lot of people have found that engaging with the bot about their problems is far less threatening than engaging with a real person. So there's a situation there, actually the tech makes it kind of neutralizes it in some way, which is very interesting. I'm not saying we just roll that out, but it's something that we should bear in mind. I think we're about done for time now, so can you run for us? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.